okay, should we resist? Should we resist? Um, I guess we're resisting state overreach. And we're talking to Tom Yamachika on Talking Tax with Tom here on a given Thursday at the 10 a.m. block. Good morning, Tom. Morning, Jay. Good, it's glad very to be gadfly here. Very of you, very gadfly of you to suggest that anyone should resist the state when it overreaches. I guess there's a number of questions here. The first one is really, is the state overreaching? Can you talk about that? Well, there, there are a lot of things, I think, um, uh, where uh, what the state does in practice and what the law says are a little bit different. Uh, and sometimes even the laws are a little bit uh, uh, unreasonable, as we found out a few years ago uh, when we attacked the, uh, uh, the, the Stop the Skim um, uh, there was the the. I remember that Linda Lingle wanted to get an override um, on state gross excise tax, and and she took ten percent out of it, which was way more than actual state expenses. Before she gave the balance to the counties, wasn't that it? Uh, that's right, but I think it might have been even before uh, Governor Lingle, because um, uh, I, I know this this was a. A thing that was negotiated, if if such is is uh, what actually happened uh, between legislative leaders and Mufi Hanneman, who is at that time mayor of Honolulu. Uh, but the but the problem then was that uh, the law that created the county surcharge on GE tax said that the that the state would keep ten percent, and um, as you mentioned. 10% uh, of the county surcharge wound up to be like 25 million a year, uh, which is far, far more than uh, the cost of enforcing it, even at the state, even at the state level. I mean, you take you take a look at the Department of Taxation, which was in charge of enforcing it. Uh, 25 million uh, was about the size of its entire budget, top to bottom. Yeah. And that was in the newspaper, but it has happened anyway. Nobody was able to stop it. You say you resisted it. Well, how successful were you? Well, uh, we sued. Uh, we we were hoping that the uh, city and county uh, whose ox was being gored uh, would put up a fuss uh, because you know uh, twenty five million was a, is a lot of money to be taken out of. Uh, uh, this this revenue stream uh, that they would need for building rail, unless they thought they were going to get a glut of money, which it turned out uh, it didn't, because they had to keep raising and raising and extending and extending the tax. They needed the money. Four point six seven billion. Four point six seven billion. It six in my head like a tattoo. That was going to be the entire cost of rail. Four point six seven billion. Ah. Where are we now? <laughs> Nowhere close. But uh, but what happened there uh, was we, the Tax Foundation, filed suit. That was in, I think, the end of 2015. Um, uh, we went into court, and uh, and the state was kind of sneering at us, saying, well, who are you, pipsqueaks? I mean, you don't have any standing to sue on this thing. This is a matter between the state and the county. And who the heck are you, you know, Mr. P Mr. Small Pipsqueak? Maybe maybe not even a taxpayer, to get involved. You're a nonprofit. Do you pay taxes? We said yes, we do. And that gives us standing. Uh, and and ultimately, uh, this went all the way up to the Hawaii Supreme Court. They decided that we did have standing, uh, but they but they found uh, the merits in the. Uh, in the state's favor. So we lost uh, the suit. Uh, what was the rule of law they enunciated? Well, they said, uh, you know, how, how are we to know uh, whether that 10% was not an unreasonable estimate of cost at the time it was enacted? We don't know. So we, so we give the legislature the benefit of the doubt. Everybody, they, in the state, everybody in the state knew it was way too much. Everybody. Yeah. I, think my puppy, I think my puppy knew. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm sure your puppy knew. Uh, but um, your, your puppy should have been on the Supreme Court. That, that would have been at least one vote the other way. Now you're talking. Yeah. Uh, but. So anyway, give, give us more. Yeah, go ahead. But. Uh, the silver lining for uh, uh, for this is, you know, because of the surrounding publicity, uh, legislators were feeling the heat because people were, you know, their constituents were telling them, yeah, this 10% is way too much. So in 2017, they enacted a law that said, okay, we won't take 10%, we'll take 1%. So, so decreased by one order of magnitude. And... Uh, and Ruby was okay with that. And, and that's what the law is today. So chalk one up for the taxpayers, not, not the, you know, perhaps uh, the uh, uh, win that people were thinking about when the, the lawsuit started, but still a win. That reminds me of a case I had one time uh, regarding an assessment of downtown office building. And, um, the state, according to my appraiser, was like $200 million beyond true value. That's no way out of line. So we were in the chambers of the judge who was trying to settle this case. And I said, $200 million over. And um, the state said, the state said, okay, okay, okay. We'll drop it down by $150 million. And I said, why did you why did you assess it at 200 million if you would fall over on 150 million in the first settlement conference? <laughs> why is that? Do you think the 200 million might have been inflated? <laughs> Just slightly, huh? <laughs> but um, but but my point in all of this was was to say, you know, there there should be people other than other than just us uh watching government um uh, especially the ones that get hurt like in this in this real uh, skim situation uh like the state said yeah the people who got hurt the most were the, were, were the city so why didn't they kind of step in and and and, and do something is that a rhetorical question what, what is the answer to that question they can do something if they want to. Why do you remember they? a few years ago when we were considering a ballot measure that would have uh, increased uh, the the real property tax or and given given control of it back to the state? Uh, the uh, the city in County Honolulu was the primary party opposing this uh, when they sued in court. Uh, then the the other counties kind of like hopped on their coattails, but they sued in court, and they were the ones that successfully invalidated the ballot measure. So they can do stuff if they want. Well, they have, they have a big stick. They're directly involved. They're a government agency. You know what makes the state so significantly more powerful than the county? The county has a big stick. That's right, and and I think they should be using it more often, uh, especially when the state overreaches. Um, one specific instance, uh, you know, other than real, uh, that I had been complaining about, uh, was their position on the transient accommodations tax. Now, as you remember, uh, the shutoff of the transient accommodations tax going to the counties, uh, didn't start with, you know, House Bill 862. It started in, in March of 2020. Uh, I, I think it was March, uh, could have been could have been May, uh, when the governor just kind of shut, shut off the spigot by executive order. And he said, using my emergency powers, I'm going to shut off this transient accommodations tax to uh, to the counties and any any of the other earmarks that that it's going to. So we're we're going to keep all the money in the general fund. And at that time, you know, we were we were kind of wondering out loud, um, okay, now. What emergency power allows you to do this? And and we and we were kind of thinking, okay, how does this um, dovetail with emergency functions? Uh, it's just a money grab. And um, I thought, and and I published a piece saying that it was just a money grab, 
and 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 it should be challenged. Uh, but did the did the, did the city and county challenge it? No. Did any other they county? Have, they have a they have a uh, corporation council with uh, dozens of lawyers there. It's not like they didn't have a lawyer handy. That's right. To, to file papers in that case, dozens of lawyers, dozens, you know, all yeah. of whom are are paid at, at market or better. That's right, and uh, it affected the other counties too, and they have departments of you know corporation council in, in all of the other counties too. So it's not just Honolulu, you know, there's Maui and Kauai and the Big Island. So why didn't any of them do anything about it? That's, I, I, you know, that's you, my question. You say it's rhetorical, but what is the real reason, Tom? Let's, let's advance this conversation into the real reason. Uh, I think they were afraid. I think they were afraid that the next time the legislature meets, uh, they would do something uh, to squish the counties flatter than a pancake. The power of the purse. Well, not not only the purse. There are other things that that they could do as well. They could make you know life difficult for the counties, uh, as as they did with House Bill Eight Sixty Two. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's let's kind of remind ourselves of what House Bill Eight Sixty Two does. Okay, yeah, it 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 shuts off uh, the uh, transient accommodations tax load to the counties. That's that's. Uh, well, what a hundred, hundred, hundred fifty million. Um, it and it. What does it replace it with? It it replaces with with a uh, a grant of authority. So the counties have to go past their own ordinance to impose a uh, up to a three percent surcharge on the county t, uh, on on the on the TAT. Okay, but uh, how do they do this? Uh, in practical terms, but how are they going to enforce it? Uh, do they get to ride upon the coattails of the state like they do for the GET? No. Uh, matter of fact, what I had heard was uh, the counties and the uh, Department of Taxation were uh, negotiating a memorandum of understanding, which would have let them do that. You know, the same as for the general excise tax, in, in properly in return for getting a getting a cut of some kind. And then the Attorney General's office stepped in and put the kibosh on it, saying, well, the statute doesn't authorize it, so you can't do that. So each county now has to uh, hire new people, make their own new forms, uh, put their own processes, procedures, enforcement, etc. in place to collect this transient accommodations tax which they didn't have before. Uh, the economies of scale are upside down. That's right. They're, they're totally upside down. Makes well, no I, I want to I add a, a story or two of my own. Sure. In, in the practice, I told you about this before the show, uh, we represented a landlord who entered into a, a long-term lease um, with the state. The state was a very hard negotiator, by the way. It required all kinds of improvements, you know, and expenditures by the landlord at the beginning of the lease to, you know, to improve the space for the state. And um, it, God, it wasn't a year into the lease when the state wrote a, a one liner saying, um, uh, we're leaving, we're leaving the space, we're, we're breaking the lease. And the landlord was, you know, hoping for a cash flow for some time. This was you know, otherwise, uh, I guess to have the state know, you know, you're not going to have a default on your hands. But instead, you had a cancellation on your hands. And this, the uh, in the lease was a, um, a, a an escape provision that probably still exists in all state leases today. This yeah, and, and federal ones also. I mean, it, it's a it's a clause called termination for convenience of the government. Yeah, it was something like that. Convenience of the government. You know, if if some administrator determines that it's in the best interest of the state to walk away from this lease and leave the landlord hanging, you know, they can. And the implicate the implication was that the the state didn't need the space anymore. Uh, I think that's the way that's the way it was conveyed. The state didn't need the space anymore. Well, a few months later, the landlord found that the state had taken exactly the same amount of square footage in a building down the block and got a better deal 
So what happened is the state found they could get a better deal down the block. And they said to the landlord, mm, take a hike. You can eat the uh, you know, startup expenses you put in and we're walking on the lease. Now, if that had been a, a private citizen, a private company, that would have been a big lawsuit. Um, but the state you know, felt that they could, they could screw this uh, landlord without so much as a fairly well. Now you can say it falls within the bounds of uh, this provision about the convenience of the government or whatever, but in fact, it was very, very unfair. And I tell you, I, and, and it was tremendous loss to the landlord, and it was not acting like a civilized um, you know, player in the community at all. So I, I'm just, I'm hanging that one out there, and I wanna tell you one more thing that, uh, that I learned in the course of practice, and that is this. Um, if you if you were involved uh, in a dispute of some kind, not necessarily involving the state, and you wanted state records under the Freedom of Information Act, it was the statute that laid out, you know, the, like a, the federal FOIA statute that laid out, uh, you know, how you get them. You write a letter and have so much time and they have to give it to you and you pay the copying costs, whatever, you know, it's a system. And, um, you know, we, we used to do that. In my term of practice, we would, you know, ask for these records, but the state would never provide them. I don't mean sometimes; I mean never. And finally, I had a conversation with with uh, some guy, and I said, "Well, why? Why is that you never actually comply with the statute? Why do you always make us sue you in court?" And he said, well, we don't think the statute goes far enough to protect us. We're the state. And so we, we, wanna, we wanna see an order from a judge. We wanna take you through a contested proceeding in front of a judge, you know, get the lawyers to write papers and make arguments about how you're entitled to these records. And only then are we gonna give them to you, not on the basis of their freedom of information. He said, it is really awful. Not only was it awful in any one single specific case, but as a matter of policy, it was worse. And that's what the state was doing. Now, I and, and I don't know if they're still doing that, but that's what they were doing then. And I well, I mean, what, what, what happened in the beginning of the pandemic uh, was that same law that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Swish! It was eliminated with the stroke of a pen. That was part of the same emergency proclamation. Chapter 92F is gone. Okay. Uh, our organization and a number of others that uh, uh, advocate for transparency in government. Uh, we had a talk with the uh, attorney general, or at least our spokesperson did, and and we got them to roll that back a little bit. Uh, but under the um, elimination of Chapter ninety two F, the state didn't really even they didn't even have to respond to a request for records. They could just throw it at the trash. Well, that's what happened. And in, in my experience, that's what happened. You didn't get a letter saying too bad for you. You got nothing. And, and when you ask them, you know, in you know, ostensibly a friendly conversation with the attorney general, that's when you found out that they, they blew this all off completely as if, as if you had no right at all. So uh, you got other examples of overreach because I, I really want to get to the core of why this is happening, how it started as a culture point in Hawaii. Well, I, I, I do agree with you that uh, that is it is a culture point in Hawaii. Uh, and I think that's the cause of the problem. Uh, we we have this culture of, oh, let's get along, you know, uh, we, we don't want to fight and, you know, we, we don't want to cause trouble. And And by the way, if we do, uh, there will be retaliation. There will be consequences. I mean, we we found that out. The foundation found that out because uh, we had somebody talk to lawmakers after we filed our rail suit, and um, uh, you know that the the person, the particular consultant we had was interested in seeing whether um, you know because we perform a public service, we could get. Uh, grant and aid or similar funding from the state, and the uh, the response we got back from a very highly placed legislator, you know, who was at that time a vice chair of one of the money committees, okay, was, look, these bozos sued the state; they're not getting a penny. 
End of story. Hmm. I, I have one for you along the same lines. Um, my neighborhood was very concerned about the circumstances of a subdivision approval. They thought it was improperly granted, PPP. And so they sued the city for that. At the same time, another person in my neighborhood went to the city council through Rod, Rod Tam, as I recall, who, who he's, he's gone now, um, and um, tried to get a bill introduced that would resolve this. And the answer from the city to that request was remarkable. And this came from the Corporation Council. Since people in your neighborhood, not necessarily the same people, by the way, since people in your neighborhood filed a suit against the city about this particular uh, subdivision application, we are not going to entertain any bill from anybody in your neighborhood about that subject. You have disqualified yourself by filing a suit. The suit had not been resolved. <clears throat> it was just pending. But the whole neighborhood was disqualified from seeking their you know, right to submit legislation bill to the city council. They, everybody was disqualified. I find that was the, something out of the year 1215. Um, it's quite remarkable. And what are you going to do? You're going to sue them again? Um, it's, it's actually a, it's a, it's a civil rights issue. But worse than that, it's a, it's a misunderstanding. Um, misunderstanding is a broad word in this context of the way our system of government works. But there well, you let me, have it, let it's me, the same thing, Tom. Well, let, let me react to that. Okay, what whatever happened to <clears throat> land of the free and home of the brave? Battles are fought all the time to keep freedom alive. Uh, the battles of today are not using muskets and sabers. Uh, some of those are in the courtroom, others are in the court of public opinion. Uh, I, I, I you know, wince sometimes when I hear about the activities of you know, some of the activist groups. But at least I got to give them credit for getting off their duffs and doing something. Um, we need, you know, we need gladiators. We need people who are willing to step into the ring, whatever, you know, whatever form it is, uh, and make the case for, you know, let's be a, a government of laws and not of men. Let's Let's not you know, carry forth these petty grievances uh, that really don't have anything to do with anything. Uh, but we're all in this to keep, you know, keep our society alive and vibrant. Um, now, not all of us were meant to be gladiators. I, I understand that. And some of, those us of us can't stand the possibility of consequences. Yeah, not everybody, not everybody wants to shed blood, but there are other ways to show bravery. Uh, you, you can complain about government oppression or overreach to a legislator. Uh, you can come to an organization like us or somebody else who does gladiator work. There are plenty of them. Tell them you appreciate them or maybe even send a few bucks their way. Um, but, the, but the worst thing that you can do, I think, is just to do nothing and let yourself be stomped on because that's what's going to happen. Now let's. Why, uh, why do people in government want this to happen? By the way, I think we have to distinguish. There are hmm, three branches of government, and, and in fact, I would divide the executive branch up into the governor, and um, and uh, the various uh, uh, departments under the governor. Um, and where, so where is the fault here, uh, or is it everywhere? I mean, you, you have the courts. Let's put them aside for now. They're not really directly relevant to this although maybe they should be. Um, you have, you have the, the administration, you have all those departments, you have the legislature, you have the county councils. Okay. Where's the fault? Well, I think primarily you need to look uh, at the legislative, not, not, not legislative, the executive departments and not the people who are on top, people who are in the middle. Because uh, a lot of times they have you know, processes, procedures, understandings, and so forth that nobody knows about. Only, only they know about it. Uh, like um, uh, this city council, oh, we're, we're going to ban everybody in your neighborhood from, you know, coming up to the city and doing anything. Uh, that's not written down anywhere. 
uh, but it's an understanding <clears throat> among people in, you know, probably middle management. Uh, and they survive when <clears throat> administrations change. Okay. They're the civil service people. They're going to stay uh, even if the department head or the, uh, uh, you know, the, the deputy director or whoever it is changes the service, the civil service people are still there. And, you know, they come up with these understandings and ideas and processes and procedures. Um, you know, whether, whether they are, uh, consistent with the, the law and the books, uh, they don't care. Because, well, I'd, I'd like to uh, offer this to your, your comment, and that is, it seems to me um, that it's an us and them mentality. In, in my time here in Hawaii, it's always been effectively that. It's the government and the consumer, the little guy. Um, and the government always has the heavier hand. And it's okay if the government sees itself as a bunch of consumers. And the consumers see themselves as a bunch of potential government. Um, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, somewhere along the line, it got to be us and them. The government is trying to maintain distance from the consumers, keep them at bay. And the consumers are all hoo hoo at the government. And they treat them uh, either with disrespect or with what do you want to call it, genuflecting total, complete over respect, you know, in order to get what they want. Um, and I and I and I think about why this has happened. This is a this is dynamic. This it, I, I can't say it was always like this. It just became more and more like this. And in order to to try to understand it, I want to tell you one last story. I'm in a meeting in the governor's office. This is governors ago, and uh, we were seeking some kind of thing on behalf of our client and. We lined up a bunch of the department people and they were all pretty much game with it. And um, the chief of staff of the government, of the governor was there. And it all seemed like it was gonna work. And then somebody said, but you know that one of these activist organizations is opposing this. And if you do this, that activist organization is gonna make a stink. And at that point, the guy running the meeting said, oh, oh no, we can't, we can't deal with that. We can't have that. We have to fade on this. We can't do the deal because some activist organization is going to oppose it. I said to myself, wait a minute, you know, just, just the, the specter, the possibility of opposition by an activist organization is gonna quash this whole discussion. You know, it's like 10 people involved in the meeting. And it was fine until he said that. Somebody said that. So what, what I conclude out of this is that somewhere along the line, um, so many people making such demands, um, a lot of them are activist demands, that the government has got skittish, that the government has got to has started to think, did start to think of it's us and them. We have to be so careful because we could be criticized. If we could be criticized, we everything is a matter of uh, shaping shaping the, the public relations and um, avoiding any accountability. Um, just um, just um, avoiding. Yeah, no, I, I think if there were more activist organizations, um, including the ones that that advocate for good government and whatever, uh, the, the dynamic would be changed to okay. Whatever we decide, somebody is going to criticize it, but that's okay. We have to do the right thing. I don't think we have that. That's where we need to get to, I think. We have a CYA kind of mentality, CYA and us and them. And uh, that and that leads to um, not a bad decision process. And it also it also leads to um, a, a, a lack, lack of interest and in caring about what's good for the state, you know, good public policy, because it's all about covering your own or calling. Um, and I think that's that's what's happened in, in my career, my observation of this. And I don't know how you fix that. You can say, well, we want more organizations to step up and demand good government. And we want it. it's a countervailing power, isn't it? 
So the ones that demand me only, right? My silo ahead of your silo. Uh, we have to have countervailing organizations that argue with that. I don't think we do. Um, yeah. So so um, so so we need, I think, uh, more of the gladiators. We need more of the uh, the countervailing forces, uh, so that you know the 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 so-called fringe forces won't. Uh, exercise uh, untoward power uh, that they shouldn't have in the first place. And of course, you were going to talk about leadership in this context. Leadership factors in quite well, of course. Um, it's uh, it's easier to stick to, you know, a position when there is, you know, a clear vision behind it um, that's integrated with you know, other things that, you know, the Department of the whole state is doing. Um, if, you, if you have that kind of leadership, uh, you know, it's, it's tougher to um, uh, rock the boat uh, or, or have the boat rocked. It, you know, if you, if, you have, if you have a ship that's, that's sailing to point, you know, to point B, and you, you don't really know how it's going to get to point B, but you're, you're kind of going that way uh, in a general direction. Well, then, yeah, you know, if, if the waves slap you around a little bit, you're, you're not going to uh, not going to go there straight. Right. But if you but if you have a, a clear plan and a, a direction, uh, the ship can always return to that. And if you follow the rule of law. You, and you need to follow the rule of law. And now that's that's around. that that's what our nation was founded upon. People shed blood for this. Okay. Um, we need to kind of go back uh, to how that played out. Yeah. And of course, this whole discussion is with due regard for what's happening on the mainland. But you know, we're focusing today on Hawaii, and we'll continue to do that in the future. I, I sure appreciate your, your thoughts on this, Tom, and, and the role you play in all of this process. And of course, I appreciate you coming on the show to discuss it. Thank you so much. Tom Yamachika, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Aloha.